Hi, I'm Shane in Sweden, and in this multi-part video series, we're going to look at HTTP response headers. We're going to look at why they are an application security issue. And we are going to, in a play-by-play test-driven development session, build a tool in C Sharp and Visual Studio, a utility, command line utility that we can use to check the quality of our HTTP response headers from a website. And we can be able to then use this utility as a part of our test suites in our secure development lifecycle. In this first part, we will introduce uh, HTTP response headers. We'll talk about what they are, what generates them, where they come from, and even why they're used. We'll also look at some of the reasons why we need to consider HTTP response headers as part of our web application security policies and as a part of our secure development and deployment lifecycle. In the parts that follow this video, we will then build a command tool that can fetch response headers from a website and evaluate them from a security hygiene point of view. So if you already know everything there is to know about response headers and security, and you just like to get stuck into the coding part, then you may want to jump directly to the next part of the video. Otherwise, uh, I hope you enjoy this introduction to HTTP response headers. Okay, so what are HTTP response headers? Well, HTTP headers in general are a part of the HTTP protocol, the web protocol that allows a client and server to talk to each other. And the headers are a way of sending extra information beyond the content that you normally have in a request or the content that you normally have in a web page. For example, a client might make a request for a web page and the client will send that request, but it will also send an additional piece of information in the form of a header, which describes which type of browser it is. This is called the user agent header. And we can show you some examples of user agent header here. So the type of string it'll send if it's a Chrome header is that first item. This header or if it's Firefox, you might see this header. These are some examples of the user agent header you'll see. The server will respond to this request and sends back the requested web page, but may also include in its headers, response header called server, which describes the type of web application server that is actually delivering the content. And here are some examples of the type of string you'll see returned as a server response header. So for example, if it's Apache, you'll see something like this, or IS, you'll see examples here, depending on the version of IS you have. So question is, can we see these headers? Can we see the response headers and the request headers? Well, the headers are not generally visible directly uh, when we load a web page. As you can see here, we've got the Google search web page, and there are no headers visible. Now you might think if we look at the page source that we'll see uh, the headers information there. But actually, we're not going to see the headers in the source because, as I mentioned previously, the headers are actually separate from the web content. It's an extra channel of information. We do have the possibility of looking at the headers if we use the extra features or advanced features of our browser. So in Chrome's case, if we go down to the More Tools and Developer Tools, or Control-Shift-I, or actually, quite often, just by pressing the uh, Function 12 key, it'll come up. So if we take up the developer tools. Now the developer tools here has a, a lot of information, a lot of different panels and tabs. If we want to see the headers, we have to go to the network tab, and then we have to reload our web page. There we see at the top, we've got our link, the actual link we're looking at the web page. If we click on that, we get a number of new tabs and one of these tabs is headers. So we can see the response headers and the request headers. So for example, if we go down to the request headers here, we can see that user agent string that I was talking about. But in this video, we're not really interested in the request headers so much. It's the response headers, it's the information we are divulging from our web application and the directives that our web application server is giving that we're gonna focus on. We're gonna focus on these headers because they can affect the overall security of your web application. 
Some headers improve the security of your website. So for example, if we look here at the response headers, we have a header which is called cross-site scripting protection. And one could imagine that having such a header is beneficial for security, and in fact, indeed it is. And other headers can occur which are perhaps less beneficial. For example, the server response header. So what generates these headers? Well, the headers can be generated at a number of different levels. Remember, web application content these days is quite dynamic. So the headers can be created actually by the framework itself that the application is built on. For example, ASP.NET and Microsoft's MVC framework. The application itself can be adding through code headers. The web server, for example, Internet Information Server, can add its own headers. There may be headers, response headers added downstream by the proxy server, for example, or the firewall. So why, why send this extra information? Well, these headers are not required there, and they are not mandatory parts of the HTTP protocol, but they do allow for extra information to be sent. For example, in the case of the user agent header, which we discussed earlier, the server can perhaps adapt the content of the web page it delivers based on what it knows about the web browser's capability. In the case of the uh, server header, this can act as an advertisement for the web application server itself. Uh, so for example, Microsoft might want uh, that header to appear because then people know that it's their web application server that's delivering the, delivering the content. It's also useful for statistical purposes. There are companies that collect server response header statistics and they accumulate this information over the world and they use it to calculate the market share owned by each type of web application server. So you can see that Apache currently has quite a large market share. And here we've got Netcraft statistics over which um, web servers have been popular for the last uh, decade. So these, these uh, headers that are delivered that we don't actually really notice or see, can't really see the header information here. So they actually serve a function and a purpose. Uh, so the question is, when would that be a negative thing? When, why would that be a security issue? If we're looking at the question of response headers and security, well, obviously, if your web page is lacking in cross-site script attack protection, it's missing that type of header. Well, that's one sort of problem. But another sort of problem is information leakage, which really is a breach of the confidentiality principle, a core part of information security. When we looked at that server header, as we mentioned earlier, the header is not actually visible initially to the end user unless they go looking for it through the developer screen. So it's actually not adding anything to the end user UX or user experience. Even if it is useful to the people who collect server statistics, it's also useful to another group, uh, which is much more negative, and that group is attackers or hackers. And we can demonstrate how that might this information might be useful to an attacker. Well, if we go to another website, this is a gaming website, and we're an attacker, we're looking at this web page, and we start examining the headers in detail. So we we'll just do the same as we did before. We'll go to the network tab, uh, then we'll reload our web page, click on the link, and look at the headers. Here we can see we've got the same server information. It's quite detailed here. We can see that this application is using Microsoft Internet Information Server version 8.5. On a basic principle of confidentiality, this is perhaps not optimal that we're delivering this information. In fact, this website is delivering a lot more. It's delivering information about which version of ASP.NET they're using, which version of MVC. And of course, also that the site is powered by ASP.NET. Why would that be a bad thing? Well, it makes the job of an attacker or a hacker much easier for they, they don't have to try to use some vulnerability that works on an Apache server, for example, because they know there's no Apache server involved here. They just need to focus on vulnerabilities that apply to Internet Information Server or MVC or ASP.NET. And in fact, with this specific version number, it makes things a lot easier. We can go directly into the uh, National NIST's National Vulnerability Database, and we can just do a search on IIS version 8.5, and this database will tell us exactly which vulnerabilities exist. This makes, makes life a bit easier for an attacker. 
Now there are ways to detect which server is being used, which web server is being used without the server response header. Since each web application server has unique small characteristics which can make it possible to detect what they are. For example, the order in which the header fields are delivered, or you can send a malformed request to the web server and look at the response, which differs slightly between the different web servers. So not using the server response header doesn't prevent attackers from knowing what your web server is, but it just makes life a little bit harder. And it's important that we make life as hard as possible for any attacker. So what should we do about our HTTP response headers? Well, the first thing you should do is research. In this video, we're not gonna go over each header type and all its pros and cons, but there are actually a number of security experts who I've made available quite a lot of useful discussions and presentations on how you should harden your HTTP response headers. A good example is, of course, Troy Hunt, uh, who's a well-known Microsoft uh, security expert who talks here about which things you don't want to have in your header, including, for example, I think he discusses the server as an example of a header you don't really want to have. And we also have another researcher here called uh, Scott Helm, who also goes into a good discussion about why you'd want to harden your HTTP response headers. And I include links to both these articles in, underneath the video. And indeed, the OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, they have quite a good discussion going in detail about the different headers and what their possible benefits or problems could be in terms of security. In fact, Scott Helm has made a quite a useful tool called Security Headers, securityheaders.com. And we can put in a website. So if we put in our google.com again and scan it, Scott's tool will generate a security report summary. You can see the green headers are the ones that are considered beneficial from a security point of view, and the red ones are, are headers that should be there that are missing. And then we've also other comment, commentable headers. So there is quite a lot of information out there available on which headers are good, which headers are bad, and certainly it's something you need to be thinking about. One very useful, for example, uh, security header, one very useful header to have from a security point of view is the content security policy. Uh, and this uh, impacts quite a lot on how browsers will render pages and, and what will happen when you're delivering a web page. So you can actually assign directives that will affect all your websites using uh, all your web pages using a content security policy. So you can say, for example, no JavaScript can be delivered, which does not come from my own domain. And that prevents uh, a lot of attacks like cross-site scripting attacks or cross-site injections. The whole point of preventing cross-site scripting attacks or injection attacks is you do not want to allow an external party the chance to affect the behavior of your website or your web application. Jamie Hankins and Breno De Winter give great demonstrations of what can happen when you do an injection attack, and we're going to demonstrate that here. We're just going to inject some JavaScript onto this website, and there's a, a link to where you can find the script below, and then set it running. And the effect on the website is instantaneous. Okay, I think it's pretty clear that uh, allowing injection attacks on your website is not a, a good thing. Now, I happen to know that uh, Troy Hunt's website has a content security policy. So if we attempt the same JavaScript injection attack on Troy Hunt's website, as we did on the other one there, and we set the script going, well, you can see that absolutely nothing happens. So this is the benefit of content security policy. You want to go through your, the research you've done and using that policy you decided upon, harden up the configuration of your web application, harden up the configuration of your web application server, go through your proxy and your firewall configurations to make sure that you're including or excluding the headers you've decided upon in your policy. There are also software components like the uh, NuGet package nwebsec 
and there's a link to that underneath the video, which can help you manage your headers. As I said before, I'm not going to go through the whole hardening process here, but I may do it in a future video. One point though in this process is that it would be very useful to be able to check as part of our development lifecycle that the correct headers are being delivered. And we can do this manually with uh, tools such as Scott Helm security headers. But it would be also good if we could create automatic tests as part of our unit test suite uh, using some sort of custom tool. And in the next videos, we're going to show you how you can build just such a custom tool. So I look forward to seeing you in the next video.